Namaste. So it's been about seven years now, I think, since I discovered Shankaracharya's Chatur Darshanam, the four views of the four different states of consciousness. And this has been a total game changer. <clears throat> it has enabled a, a higher level of ontological analysis than ever before. And it unifies so many disparate fields and sets of terminology into a common language based on our daily experience. Every day we experience waking consciousness, dream consciousness, deep sleep, and the highest pure awareness, Turiya. Now, the thing is, there are socially approved, authorized understandings of consciousness, and then there are socially disapproved, unauthorized uh, states of consciousness or understandings of consciousness, especially dreams. And why is that? Why does popular lore and popular philosophy and religion try to steer us away from dreams and tell us that jagrat, waking consciousness, is the only reality? That these bodies and senses and their objects are real and that they are all the only reality and everything else is just a dream. Well, it turns out dreams and especially the ability to project dreams on waking consciousness is probably that very thing that distinguishes human beings from lower creatures. In other words, we can think. <laughs> because what is thinking? It's a dream that is superimposed on waking consciousness. Memory, the same way. Intelligence, absolutely. So what we have here is a social contract that devalues dreams, which are, however, the very wellspring of our humanity, uh, the source of our intelligence, our creativity, and so on. The ability to discover things is a mixture of memory and associative thought with dreaming, imagination, creativity. Without these things, where would we be? Huh? We'd be bored. <laughs> We'd be sitting in some cave, bored out of our minds. But really, <laughs> the ability to dream, the ability to imagine, to create new worlds, new phenomena, new identities, new relationships, all kinds of originality and novelty come from dreaming, isn't it? Ask any creative person, any insightful person, and they will tell you that the answer to so many problems, the inspiration for so many great creations come from dreams. Come on. Everybody knows, every child knows this. But we tend to forget it in adulthood as we have signed so many agreements that limit us to physical things physical work uh, as being the, how can I say, ultimate determinant and measuring stick of how good we're doing as a human being. huh? How much money do you make? What kind of car do you drive? How do you dress? How do you look? Are you in shape? See? These things are all determined by basically arbitrary decisions of taste based on the material senses, under the assumption that the idea is to maximize physical enjoyment. So the purpose of life has to be something more than that. The purpose of life has to be insight and understanding of the self, because in investigating the self, and in particular investigating the higher states of consciousness, I use that word deliberately, higher than waking. Dreaming is higher than waking. And why is that? 
because our dreams drive our waking experience. Did you ever have a bad dream and then the next day, the whole day is kind of colored by it? Or on the other hand, you have a great dream, you have a beautiful dream, and then you just float through the next day. <laughs> Nothing can get to you, right? Because it puts you in a certain mood. It gives you a certain bias, a certain attitude, a particular kind of spin on the things that you experience during your waking consciousness. So we could say that dreaming is the background, the context for waking consciousness. See, of course, there's a reciprocal influence also, such as if you have a particularly intense experience during waking consciousness, it can come up, it can and will come up in dreams for months or even years afterwards, especially traumas. If you've had a particularly intense trauma in your life, it may reappear in dreams and so on. So you can digest it. See, but actually our dreams, and I include thinking and the inner conversation, you know, the inner monologue or dialogue, colors our waking experience to such an extent. For example, the classic example is the rope and the snake. Huh? Somebody's half asleep, stumbling out uh, to go pee in the outhouse or something like this, and he sees, actually he sees a rope coiled up in a corner, but he thinks it's a snake. So this is the classic example, because why? It shows how we can project a dream onto so-called reality and perceive it as reality and react to it as if it's reality. And it affects us as if the real experience would. So, of course, where is the snake? That's the question. That's the point I want to make here. We've talked about this example. I mean, I mean everybody talks about it. <laughs> so, uh, where is the snake exactly? Well, it's in dream consciousness. The snake is imaginary. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It means that it exists only in the dream. But since we have this habit of overlaying the dream, uh, a vyaya, superimposition of the dream on the sensory uh, screen, uh, the uh, picture of reality that we integrate from the various sense inputs, which is also a dream, by the way, uh, <laughs> it appears to be real even in Jagrat consciousness. And certainly when we co uh, create dreams such as uh, nations and religions and languages and mathematics and so on, its reality is measured in our ability to project it onto a jagrat, waking consciousness, and make it stick. Isn't it? Like when someone forms a corporation, uh, this fictitious entity. <laughs> and, and, you know, the law and everything acknowledges that it is a fiction, right? But then, after all the papers are signed and the money changes hands and whatever, everybody walks around acting as if a corporation is a real thing. You know, if you said, well, I had this dream last night, and now I'm going to act as if that dream was real, people would think you're crazy, right? <laughs> but we do it all the time. We act as if our race, our religion, our country, our political party and beliefs, our um, military and so on are real when actually they're only verbal abstractions that we manipulate in our inner conversation, which is a dream that's projected on our daily experience. So, when people say, can you show me God? I think a really, you know, this is a typical atheist's criticism. Can you show me God? Can I perceive God with my senses? 
Actually, the answer is yes. If you can imagine God, you can perceive God with your intelligence, with your mind, which are dreams. So yeah, God is real, but real in dream consciousness, not in jagrat. Like the atheists like to say, you don't meet God walking down the street. Well, unless you're thinking of God, unless you're chanting God's name, unless you're immersed in the lore and the lifestyle of trying to understand and appreciate and approach God, see, then to you, God is real. Why? Because he's in your dream. See? And then all these people start fighting about whose dream of God they should superimpose on the reality. Oh, boy. <laughs> See, if people just understood this simple point that the world of senses is one world and the world of dreams is another world, and the things that exist in those worlds are real when you're in those states of consciousness— like when you're dreaming at night, whatever you're dreaming about is totally real to you. Maybe when you wake up in the morning, it doesn't seem real, but now you're in a different state of consciousness. See, you're in Jagra. But when you're in Swapna, man, those dreams sure do seem real, don't they? <laughs> so you see, this is the understanding. And then to go one more level up, Sushupti, deep sleep, dreamless sleep. This is actually a different state of consciousness. It's consciousness without an object. And so, <clears throat> Sushupti as nothingness, emptiness, the void, begs the question, what do I want to create? What do I want to be aware of? In other words, what kind of consciousness do I want? And what kind of contents? So, Actually, sushupti, the void, or so-called emptiness, or whatever you want to call it, is actually the zero point, the, um, the, the, the quantum state which holds all potential, right? Which, if you can tap into it, becomes such a powerful creative force that it can create the whole world, and it does. It does. The worlds that we inhabit are mostly self-created. How is that? Well, see, then we have to go even higher <laughs> and say, we are ultimately Brahman. I mean, consciousness, or I should say awareness, unconditioned awareness is the absolute. It's unborn, undying, unchanging, primeval. <laughs> it's not born when the body is born, and it's not going to die when the body dies. It's forever. Forever in the past as well as forever in the future. So that's even beyond eternity because eternity, the concept is related to the lifespan of the material universe, which we know is finite. So that Brahman, that absolute, then chooses to cloak itself, first of all, in the concept of nothingness. Was, well, what is nothingness? Nothingness is a pregnant space, space of consciousness. Like Buddha says in the four immaterial jhanas, he calls them unlimited space, unlimited consciousness, neither perception nor non-perception. See, and nothingness. Because in nothingness, in emptiness, in the void, you, there is no test to prove that you are perceptic, that you are aware. Because there are no objects. See, as soon as you become aware of anything, you know you're aware. You have proof, you have verification. But if there are no objects, if there's only emptiness, only the space for objects, there's no way to prove even to yourself that you're aware, except 
that you are aware of nothing. This is sushupti. This is also samadhi. This is also nibbana. This is also svarga. This is also shanti. See? The peace that passeth all understanding. See, th this is what all religions, all spiritual paths talk about as the ultimate. This is Turiya. Right? <clears throat> so, this is also Shiva and Jehovah and Krishna and the goddess and whatever name you want to attach to it. The Supreme. The Purusha. The original person. Vishnu. He exists within us as a state of consciousness. And when we come out, usually people flee from emptiness, from sushupti. But if you can get comfortable in it, if you can hold it to the point where you can inspect it, you find that it's actually a great refuge from all the trials and tribulations and travails of the material existence, both subtle and gross, both mental and physical. See? Because really what we're talking about here is being aware in the five bodies. The five bodies are the anamaya kosha, physical body or food body, the pranamaya kosha, the energy body, the subtle body, the manomaya kosha, the mental body, vijnana maya kosha, the intelligence body, intelligence, will, ego, and like that, the antakarana, and finally, ananda maya kosha, which is the consciousness body, the body of pure, unconditioned awareness, which is also bliss. Okay. We all have these five bodies, and we can be aware in any of them or any combination of them at any time. See, that's what it means to be a sovereign consciousness. When you have mastered all these different states, when you have mastered all the transitions between all the different bodies and their contents and so forth, this is enlightenment. This is a big deal. See, this is a great science. So when we talk about, you know, the world of dreams, and we're talking about something very specific that everybody experiences every single day. They just call it something different. They have a different mythology about it. They have a different ontology about it. So our ontology is the most powerful. That coming from Shankaracharya, from the school of Advaita, uh, his school of Advaita, <laughs> Not the nonsense modern Neo-Advaita, the original Advaita that was based on Vedanta. And Vedanta and Advaita, they both say that enlightenment or um, liberation or uh, realization of Brahman, self-realization, is not possible by any kind of learning, whether it's studying texts or hearing from enlightened people. That's good, you know. But it's not sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient to attain actual enlightenment. The only way to attain that is to, as we've been saying for like more than 10 years now, turn the light around. Turn the light of consciousness on itself. Instead of looking out at the world or even the mind, look at consciousness itself. And gradually, if you contemplate these things over a long period of time and observe yourself honestly, all these truths will become self-evident. Aung um, Tatsat. Aung um, Shakti Aung. Um. Aung um, Namah Shivaya. <laughs>